That is mine, she said, extreme pride. I made it. I'm not strong enough to use regular brake line against my mother or anyone your size. Would you show it to me? I asked. Celian hesitated, then nodded and stepped forward, holding out her hand. Grab my wrist. Just answer, anchor that shit. I mean, I'm here. I took hold of it, gripping firmly, but not fiercely. She did it again, like a magic trick. Both of her hands moved in a flurry of motion, and I was left with a stinging, empty hand. I reached out again. Amusement. I have slow barbarian eyes. Could you make it again so I can learn it? Celian stepped back, shrugging. Indifference. Am I your teacher? Should I give something of mine to a barbarian who cannot even strike me in the fight? She lifted her chin and looked off toward the spinning sword tree, but her eyes darted back to me playfully. I chuckled and came to my feet, bringing up my hands again. She laughed and turned to face me. Go! This time, I was ready, and I knew what Celian was capable of. She was no sort of delicate flower. She was quick and fearless and aggressive. So I went on the offensive, taking advantage of my long arms and legs. I struck out with Dancing Maiden, but she skipped away. No, it would be better to say she slid away from me, never compromising her balance in the least, her feet weaving smoothly through the long grass. Then she changed direction suddenly, catching me between steps and slightly off my stride. She feigned a punch at my groin, then pushed me slightly off balance with turning millstone. I staggered, but managed to keep my feet beneath me. I tried to regain my balance, but she brushed me again with turning millstone, then again, and again, each time only shoving me a few inches, but it kept me in a helpless stumbling retreat until she managed to plant her foot behind mine, tripping me and sending me flat onto my back. Before I'd finished striking the ground, she already had hold of my wrist, and soon had my arm tangled firmly in ivy on the oak. This pressed my face into the grass while putting uncomfortable pressure against my wrist and shoulder. For a second, I considered trying to struggle free, but only for a second. I was stronger than she was, but the whole point of positions like Ivy on the Oak and Sleeping Bear is to put pressure on the fragile parts of the body. You did not need a great deal of strength to attack the branch. I submit, I said. This is easier to say in a demic. Veh, an easy noise to make when you are winded, tired, or in pain. I'd become rather used to saying it lately. Celian let go of me and stepped away, watching as I sat up. We could probably walk up to this rock. You really aren't very good, she said with brutal honesty. I'm not used to striking young girls, I said. How could you become used to it, she laughed. To grow used to a thing, you must do it over and again. I, don't know what's happening. I expect you have never struck a woman even once. Celian extended a hand. I took it in what I hoped was a gracious manner, and she helped pull me to my feet. I mean, where I come from, it is not right to fight with women. I do not understand, she said. Do they not let the men fight in the same place as the women? I mean, for the most part, our women do not fight, I explained. Celian rolled her wrist over, opening and closing her hand as if there were some dirt on the palm and she was absentmindedly trying to rub it off. It was the hand-talk equivalent of puzzlement, a confused frown of sorts. How do they improve their K-10 if they do not practice, she asked. Where I come from, the women have no K-10 at all. Her eyes narrowed, then brightened. You mean to say they have a secret, Keitan, she said, using the Aturan word for secret. Though her face was composed, her body vibrated with excitement. A Keitan only they know that the men are not allowed to see. Celian pointed over to the bench where our teachers sat ignoring us. Bashet has such a thing. I have asked her to show it to me many times, but she will not. Bashet knows another Keitan, I asked. Celian nodded. She was schooled in the path of joy before she came to us. She looked over at her, her face serious, as if she would pull the secret out of the other woman by sheer force of will. Someday, I will go there and learn it. I will go everywhere, and I will learn all the Ketans there are. I will learn the hidden ways of the ribbon, and the chain, and of the moving pool. 
I will learn the paths of joy and passion and restraint. I will have all of them. When she spoke, Celian didn't say this in a tone of childish fancy, as if she were daydreaming of eating an entire cake. Neither was she boastful, as if she were describing a plan she had put together on her own and thought very clever. Celian said it with a quiet intensity. It was almost as if she were simply explaining who she was. Not to me. She was telling herself. She turned back to look at me. I will go to your land, too, she said, absolute. And I will learn the barbarian, Keitan, your women keep secret from you. You will be disappointed, I said. I did not misspeak. I know the word for secret. What I meant to say is that where I come from, many women do not fight. Celian rolled her wrist again in puzzlement, and I knew I had to be more clear. Where I come from, most women spend their whole lives without holding a sword. Most grow up not knowing how to strike another with a fist or the blade of their hand. They know nothing of any sort of K-10. They do not fight at all. I stressed the last two words with strong negation. That finally seemed to get the point across to her. I had half expected her to look horrified, but instead, she simply stood there blankly, hands motionless, as if at a loss for what to think. It was as if I just explained to her that the women where I came from didn't have any heads. They do not fight? She asked dubiously. Not rock. with the men or with each other we have to, or with anyone play. at all? I nodded. I mean, there was a long, long side. pause. No. Her brow furrowed, and I could actually so see her struggling to come to grips with this idea. That, like, Confusion. Dismay. Yeah, we're on the, we're on then the what side, do like, they do? Time. She said at last. I thought of the women I knew. Mola, mm -hmm. Fella, Davy. Many things, kills, I said, that was, uh, having to improvise yeah, around the words I didn't know. Four different teams. I got shot up by they make drop, pictures out of LG, stones. And I got shot up by they Randall, buy and sell money. Fury. They write in books. Celian seemed to relax as I recited this list, as if relieved to hear these foreign women, empty of any K-Tan, weren't strewn around the countryside like boneless corpses. They heal the sick and mend wounds. They play... I almost said play music and sing songs, but caught myself in time. They play games and plant wheat and make bread. Celian thought for a long moment. I would rather do those things and fight as well, she said decisively. Some women do, but for many it is considered not of the Lathani. I used the phrase like of the Lathani yes, because I could not like think of how to say like proper behavior in a demic. Celian gestured sharp disdain like and reproach. If we went to like I was amazed how much more it stung coming from this young side, girl in her bright yellow shirt than it ever rock, had like, from Tempe or Vachette. Like that's, that could be a play. The Lathani is the same everywhere, she said firmly. It is not like the wind changing from place to place. The Lathani is like water, I responded without thinking. It is itself unchanging, but it shapes itself to fit all places. It is both the river and the rain. She glared at me. It was not a furious glare, but coming from one of the Adem, it had the same effect. Who are you to say the Lethani is like one thing and not another? Who are you to do the same? Celian looked at me but for a really moment, the hint of a serious the line between her pale there eyebrows. Was, there be a team then she and laughed there be brightly a team, and brought up her hands. Be a team us, I am Celian, she proclaimed. Like, My mother is of the third stone. Like I am Adem over. born, and I am the one who would throw you to the ground. She was as good as her word. Chapter 118. Purpose. Vachette and I fought, moving back and forth across the foothills of Ademre. After all this time, I barely noticed the wind anymore. It was as much a part of the landscape as the uneven ground beneath my feet. Some days it was gentle, and did little more than make patterns in the grass or flick my hair into my eyes. Other days it was strong enough to make the loose fabric of my clothes crack and snap against my skin. 
It could come at you from unexpected directions without a moment's warning, pushing you as firmly as a hand between your shoulder blades. Why do we spend so much time on my hand fighting? I asked Bashat as I made picking clover. Because your hand fighting is sloppy, Bashat said, blocking me with fan water. Because you embarrass me every time we fight, and because three times a four you lose to a child half your size. But my sword fighting is even worse. I said as I circled, looking for an opening. It is worse, she acknowledged. That is why I do not let you fight anyone but me. You are too wild. You could hurt someone. I smiled. I thought that was the point of this. Bashat frowned, then reached out casually to grip my wrist and shoulder, twisting me into sleeping bear. Her right hand held my wrist over my head, stretching my arm at an awkward angle, while her left pressed firmly against my shoulder. Helpless, I was forced to bend at the waist, staring at the ground. Veh, I said in submission. But Vachette didn't release me. She twisted, and the pressure against my shoulder increased. The small bones of my wrist began to ache. Veh, I said a little louder, thinking she hadn't heard me. But still, she held me, twisting a little harder at my wrist. Vachette! I tried to turn my head to look at her, but from this angle, all I could see was her leg. If the point of this is to hurt someone, she said, why should I let you go? That's not what I meant. Bashat pushed down harder, and I stopped talking. What is the purpose of sleeping bear? She asked calmly. To incapacitate your opponent, I said. Very well. Vachette began to bear down with the slow, relentless force of a glacier. Dull pain began to build in my shoulder as well as my wrist. Soon your arm will be twisted from the cup of your shoulder. Your tendons will stretch and pull free of the bone. Your muscles will tear and your arm will hang like a wet rag at your side. Then will Sleeping Bear have served its purpose? I struggled a bit out of pure animal instinct, but it only turned the burning pain into something sharper, and I stopped. Over the course of my training, I had been put into inescapable positions before. Every time I had been helpless, but this time was the first time I had truly felt that way. The purpose of sleeping bear is control, Bashat said calmly. Right now, you are mine to do with as I wish. I can move you or break you or let you free. I would prefer free, I said, trying to sound more hopeful than desperate. There was a pause. Then she asked calmly, What is the purpose of sleeping bear? Control! I felt her hands release me, and I stood, slowly rolling my shoulder to ease the ache. Vachette stood there, frowning at me. The point of all of this is control. First, you must have control of yourself. Then you can gain control of your surroundings. Then you gain control of whoever stands against you. This is the Latani. After the better part of a month in Hert, I could not help but feel that things were going well. Vachette acknowledged that my language was improving, congratulating me by saying I sounded like a child rather than just an imbecile. I continued to meet with Celian in the grassy field next to the sword tree. I looked forward to these encounters, despite the fact that she thrashed me with cheerful ruthlessness every time we fought. It took three days before I finally managed to beat her. That's an interesting verse to add to the long story of my life, isn't it? Come listen all, and I will tell, a tale of brave and daring deeds, of wonders quoth the bloodless rot, and of the time he bravely fought, a twiggling girl no more than ten, and listen how it came to pass, the mighty blow he bravely dealt that knocked her sprawling to the grass and of the glow of joy he felt. Awful as it might sound, I was proud, and justifiably so. Celian herself congratulated me when it happened, seeming more than a little surprised that I had managed it. There, in the long shadow of the sword tree, she showed me her two-handed variant of breaking lion as a reward, flattering me with the familiarity of an impish grin. That same day we finished our prescribed number of bouts early. I went to sit on a nearby lump of stone that had been smoothed into a comfortable seat. 
I nursed my dozen small hurts from the fight and prepared to watch the sword tree until Vachette returned to fetch me. Celian, however, was not the sort to sit and wait. She skipped over to the sword tree, standing only a few feet from where the longest branches bobbed and danced in the wind, sending the round, razor-sharp leaves turning in wild circles. Then she lowered her shoulders and darted under the canopy in among the thousand madly spinning leaves. I was too startled to cry out, but I did come halfway to my feet before I heard her laughing. I watched as she darted and jigged and spun, her tiny body dodging out of the way of the wind-tossed leaves as if she were playing tag. She made it halfway to the trunk and stopped. She ducked her head, reached out, and swatted away a leaf that otherwise would have cut her. No, she didn't just lash out. She used drifting snow. Then I watched her move even closer to the trunk, weaving back and forth and protecting herself. First, she used maiden combs her hair, then dance backwards. Then she skipped to one side, the K-10 abandoned. She crouched and sprinted through a gap in the leaves and made her way to the trunk of the tree, slapping it with one hand. And she was back among the leaves. She made pressing cider, ducked and spun and ran until she was clear of the canopy. She didn't shout out in triumph as a Commonwealth child might have, but she jumped into the air, hands raised in victory. Then... Still laughing, she did a cartwheel. Breathless, I watched Celian play her game again and again, moving in and out of the tree's dancing leaves. Two games, two games. She didn't always make I mean, it to the trunk. It's kind of Twice, heavy. she scampered game, back out of the reach of the game. leaves without making it, and it was obvious, even from where I sat, that she was angry. Once, she slipped and was forced to crawl out under the reach of the leaves. But she made it to the trunk and back four times each time celebrating her escape with upraised hands, laughter, and a single perfect cartwheel. She only stopped when Vachette returned. I watched from a distance as Vachette stormed over and gave the girl a stern telling off. I couldn't hear what was said, but their body language spoke volumes. Celian looked down and shuffled her feet. Vachette shook a finger and cuffed the young girl on the side of her head. It was the same scolding any child receives. Stay out of the neighbor's garden. Don't tease the Benton sheep. Don't play tag among the thousand spinning knives of your people's sacred tree. No, there's nobody at high point. No bullshit. Chapter 119. Hands. Once Vachette judged my language only moderately embarrassing, she arranged for me to talk with an odd handful of people scattered around Hert. There was a garrulous old man who spun silk thread while chattering endlessly, telling strange, pointless, half-delirious stories. There was a story of a boy who put shoes on his head to keep a cat from being killed. Another where a family swore to eat a mountain stone by stone. I could never make any sense of them, but I listened politely and drank the sweet beer he offered me. I met with twin sisters who made candles and showed me the steps of strange dances. I spent an afternoon with a woodcutter who spoke for hours of nothing but splitting wood. At first, I thought these were important members of the community. I thought Vachette might be parading me in front of them in order to show how civilized I had become. It wasn't until I spent the morning with two fingers that I realized she sent me to each of these people with the hope I would learn something. Two fingers was not his real name. I'd merely come to think of him as that. He was a cook at the school, and I saw him at every meal. His left hand was whole, but his right was viciously crippled, with only his thumb and forefinger remaining. Vachette sent me to him in the morning, and together we prepared lunch and talked. His name was Naden. He told me he had spent ten years among the barbarians. What's more, he had brought more than 230 silver talents back into the school before he was injured and could no longer fight. He mentioned the last several times, and I could tell that it was a particular point of pride with him. Down, but the bells rang, and folk filtered into the dining hall. Naden ladled up the stew we'd made, hot and thick with chunks of beef and carrot. I cut slices of warm white bread for those who wanted it. I exchanged nods and occasional polite gestures with those who moved through the line. I was careful to make only the briefest eye contact and tried to convince myself it was just a coincidence so few people seemed interested in bread today. 
Carceret made a show of her feelings for everyone to see. First, she made it to the front of the line, then made a widely visible gesture of abhorrent disgust before walking away, leaving her wooden plate behind. Later, Naden and I tended to the washing up. Veshe tells me your sword play is progressing poorly, he said without preamble. She says you fear too much for your hands, and this makes you hesitant. Firm reproach. I froze at the abruptness of it, fighting the urge to stare at his ruined hand. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. He turned from the iron pot he was scrubbing and held out his hand in front of him. It was a defiant gesture, and his face was hard. I looked then, as ignoring it would be rude. Only his thumb and forefinger remained, enough to grip at things, but not enough for any delicate work. The half of his hand that remained was a mass of puckered scar. I kept my face even, but it was hard. In some ways, I was looking at my worst fear. I felt very self-conscious of my uninjured hands and fought the urge to make a fist or hide them behind my back. It has been a dozen years since this hand held a sword, Naden said. Proud anger, regret. I have thought long on that fight where my fingers were lost. I did not even lose them to a skilled opponent. They fell to some barbarian whose hands were better suited to a shovel than the sword. He flexed his two fingers. In some ways, he was lucky. There were other Adam in Hert who were missing entire hands or eyes or limbs to the elbow or knee. I have thought a long time. How could I have saved my hand? I have thought about my contract, protecting a baron whose lands were in rebellion. I think, what if I had not taken that contract? I think, what if I had lost my left hand? I could not talk, but I could hold a sword. He let his hand drop to his side. But holding a sword is not enough. A proper mercenary requires two hands. I could never make lover out the window or sleeping bear with only one. He shrugged. It is the luxury of looking backward. You can do it forever, and it is useless. I took the red proudly. I brought over 230 talents to the school. I was of the second stone, and I would have made the third in time. Naden held up his ruined hand again. There's a phoenix I could have right gained there. none of these things if I had lived in fear of losing my hand. If I flinched and cringed, I would never have been accepted into the Latanta. Never made the second stone. I would be whole, but I would be less than I am now. He turned back and began to scrub the pots again. After a moment, I joined him. Is it bad? I asked quietly, unable to help myself. Naden didn't answer for a long moment. When it first happened, I thought to myself, it was not so bad. Others have had worse wounds, others have died. I was luckier than them. He drew in a deep breath, then let it out slowly. I tried to think it was not bad. My life would continue on, but no. Life stops. Much is lost. Everything is lost. Then he said, When I dream, I have two hands. We finished the dishes together, sharing silence between us. Sometimes, that is all you can share. Celian had a lesson of her own to teach me. Namely, that there are opponents who will not hesitate to punch, kick, or elbow a man directly in his genitals. Never hard enough to permanently injure me, mind you. She'd been fighting her entire young life and had the control Vashat valued so highly. But that meant she knew exactly how hard to strike to leave me stunned and reeling, making her victory utterly unquestionable. So I sat on the grass, feeling gray and nauseous. After incapacitating me, Celian had given me a comforting pat on the shoulder before skipping blithely away, no doubt going to dance among the wind-tossed branches of the sword tree again. You were doing well until the end, Bashat said, lowering herself onto the ground across from me. I said nothing. Like a child playing find and catch, 
It was my sincere hope that if I closed my eyes and remained perfectly still, the pain wouldn't be able to find me. Come now, I saw her kick, Bashat said dismissively. It was not so hard as that. I heard her sigh. I mean, we ha we would still, have to if you need someone to look right at them and make sure they are still right? intact, if we don't, I chuckled slightly. From it was a mistake. Unbelievable pain uncoiled in my groin, radiating down to my knee and up to my sternum. Nausea rolled over me, and I opened my eyes to steady myself. She will grow out of it, Bashat said. I should hope so, I said through gritted teeth. It's a noxious habit. I don't know what that guy's shooting through. That right? is he's not what I meant, like Bashat said. I mean, she will grow taller. Hopefully Pretty then she will distribute she, her attentions more crash. evenly across the body. Right now she attacks the groin too regularly. It makes her easy to predict and defend against. She gave me a pointed look. Wait, to anyone with a shred of wit. I closed my eyes again. No lessons right now, Vashat, I begged. I'm ready to vomit up yesterday's breakfast. She climbed to her feet. It sounds like the perfect time for a lesson. Stand up. You should learn how to fight while wounded. This is an invaluable skill Celian has given you the chance to practice. You should thank her. Knowing it was pointless to argue, I climbed to my feet and began to walk gingerly toward my training sword. Bashat caught me by the shoulder. No, hands only. I sighed. Must we, Vashat? I, I know she raised I'll an eyebrow at me. <laughs> Must we what? Must we focus always on hand fighting, I said. My sword play is falling farther and farther behind. Am I not your teacher? She asked. Who are you to say what is best? I am the one who will have to use these skills out in the world, I said pointedly. And out in the world, I would rather fight with a sword than a fist. Vashat lowered her hands, her expression blank. And why is that? Because other people have swords, I said. And if I'm in a fight, I intend to win. Is winning a fight easier with a sword? She asked. Vashat's outward calm should have warned me I was stepping onto thin conversational ice but I was distracted by the nauseating pain radiating from my groin. Though honestly, even if I hadn't been distracted, it's possible I wouldn't have noticed. I had grown comfortable with Vashat, too comfortable to be properly careful. Of course, I said. Why else carry a sword? That is a good question, she said. Why does one carry a sword? Why do you carry anything so you can use it? Vashat gave me a look of raw disgust. Why do we bother to work on your language then? She asked angrily, reaching out to grab my jaw, pinching my cheeks and forcing my mouth open as if I were a patient in the Medica refusing my medicine. Why do you need this tongue if a sword will do? Tell me that. And then we just have to clear out the bottom. I tried to pull away, but she was stronger than me. I tried to push her away, but she shrugged my flailing hands away as if I were a child. Bashat let go of my face, then caught my wrist, jerking my hand up in front of my face. Why do you have hands at all and not knives at the end of your arms? Then she let go of my wrist and struck me hard across the face with the flat of her hand. If I say she slapped me, you will take the wrong impression. This wasn't the dramatic slap of the sort you see on a stage. Neither was it the offended, stinging slap a lady-in-waiting makes against the smooth skin of a too-familiar nobleman. It wasn't even the more professional slap of a serving girl defending herself from the unwelcome attention of a grabby drunk. No. This was hardly any sort of slap at all. A slap is made with the fingers or the palm. It stings or startles. Vashat struck me with her open hand, but behind that was the strength of her arm. Behind that was her shoulder. Behind that was the complex machinery of her pivoting hips, her strong legs braced against the ground, and the ground itself beneath her. It was like the whole of creation striking me through the flat of her hand. And the only reason it didn't cripple me is that even in the middle of her fury, Vashat was always perfectly in control. 
Because she was in control, Vashat didn't dislocate my jaw or knock me unconscious. But it made my teeth rattle and my ears ring. It made my eyes roll in my head and my legs go loose and shaky. I would have fallen if Vashat hadn't gripped me by the shoulder. Do you think I am teaching you the secrets of the sword so you can go out and use them? She demanded. I dimly realized she was shouting. It was the first time I had ever heard one of the Adem raise their voice. Is that what you think we are doing here? As I lolled in her grip, stupefied, she struck me again. This time, her hand caught more of my nose. The pain of it was amazing, as if someone had driven a sliver of ice directly into my brain. It jolted me out of my daze, so I was fully alert when she hit me the third time. Vachette held me for a moment while the world spun, then let go. I took one unsteady step and crumpled to the ground like a puppet with its strings cut, not unconscious, but profoundly dazed. It took me a long time to collect myself. When I was finally able to sit up, my body felt loose and unwieldy, as if it had been taken apart and put back together again in a slightly different way. By the time I gathered my wits enough to look around, I was alone. Chapter 120 Kindness. Austin, Two hours strange. later, I sat alone in the dining hall. My head ached, and the side of my face was hot and swollen. I'd bitten my tongue at some point, so it hurt to eat, and everything tasted of blood. My mood was exactly what you might imagine, except worse. When I saw a red form slide onto the bench across from me, I dreaded looking up. If it was Carceret, it would be bad. But Vachette would be even worse. I had waited until the dining hall was almost empty before coming to eat, hoping to avoid them both. But glancing up, I saw it was Pentha, the fierce young woman who had beaten Shayan. Hello, she said in lightly accented Aturin. I gestured polite formal greeting. Considering the way my day was going, I thought it best to be as careful as possible. Vachette's comments we, led me to believe we, Pentha was a high-ranking and well-respected member of the school. So For all that, she wasn't very old. Perhaps like, it was her small yeah, frame or her heart-shaped face, but she didn't look much more than twenty. Is that spot not good on your ping? Could we speak your language? She asked in a turin. It would be a kindness. I am in need of practice with my talking. I will gladly join you, I said in a turin. You speak very well. I am jealous. When I speak Edemic, I feel I am a great bear of a man stomping around in heavy boots. Pentha gave a small, shy smile, then covered her mouth with her hand, blushing slightly. Is that correct, to smile? It is correct, and polite. A smile such as that shows a small amusement, which is perfect, as mine was a very small joke. Pentha removed her hand and repeated the shy smile. She was charming as spring flowers. It eased my heart to look at her. Normally, I said, I would smile in answer to yours, but here I worry others would view it as impolite. Please, she said, making a series of gestures wide enough for anyone to see. Bold invitation, imploring entreaty, familiar welcome. I must practice. I smiled, though not quite as widely as I would have ordinarily, partly out of caution and partly because my face hurt. It feels good to smile again, I said. I have anxiousness about my smiling. She started to gesture and stopped herself. Her expression shifted, her eyes narrowing a bit, as if she were irritated. Guys, I'm terrible right now. This? I asked, gesturing mild worry. She nodded. We're in right here. How do you make that with the face? It is like this. I drew my brows together slightly. And also, as a woman, you would do this. I pursed my lips slightly. I would do this as I am a man. I drew my lips down into a small frown instead. Pentha looked at me blankly, aghast. It is different for men and women? She asked disbelief creeping into her tone. Only some, I reassured her. 
and only small things. There is so much, she said, allowing a note of despair into her voice. With one's family, one knows what every small movement of face means. You grow up watching. You know the all of what is in them. Those friends you are young with, before you know better than to grin at everything. It is easy with them, but this... She shook her head. How can one possibly remember when to correctly show one's teeth? How often am I supposed to touch eyes? I understand, I said. I am very good at speaking in my language. I can make the cleverest meanings. But here that is useless. I sighed. Keeping my face still is very hard. I feel I'm always holding my breath. Not always, she said. We are not always still of the face. When you are with... She trailed off, then quickly gestured, apology. I have none I am close to, I said. Gentle regret. Oh, I'm just talking about Endgame. I had hoped I was growing close to Vachette, but I fear I ruined that today. Pentha nodded. I saw. She reached out and ran her thumb along the side of my face. It felt cool against the swelling. You must have angered her very. I can tell that by the ringing of my ears, I said. Pentha shook her head. No. Your marks... She gestured to her own face this time. With another, it might be a mistake, but Vachette would not leave such if she did not wish everyone to see. The bottom dropped out of my stomach, and my hand went unconsciously to my face. Of course. This wasn't mere punishment. It was a message to all of a Demre. Fool that I am, I said softly. I did not realize this until now. We ate quietly for several minutes before I asked, Why did you come to sit with me today? When I saw you today, I thought I had heard many people speak about you, but I knew nothing of you from personal knowing. A pause. And what do others say? I said with a small, wry smile. She reached out to touch the corner of my mouth with her fingertips. That, she said, what is the bent smile? And then I was trying to get the knock. Gentle mocking. I gestured in explanation. But of myself, not you. I can guess what they say. Not all is bad, she said gently. Pentho looked up at me and met my eyes then. They were huge in her small face, slightly darker gray than usual. They were so bright and clear that when she smiled... The sight of it almost broke my heart. I felt tears well up in my eyes, and I quickly looked down, embarrassed. Oh, she said softly, and gestured a hurried, distressed apology. No, I am wrong with my smiling and eye-touching. I meant this. Kind encouragement. You are right with your smiling, I said without looking up, blinking furiously in an attempt to clear the tears away. It is an unexpected kindness on a day when I do not deserve such a thing. You are the first to speak with me from your own desire, and there is a sweetness in your face that hurts my heart. I made gratitude with my left hand, glad that I didn't need to meet her eyes to show her how I felt. Her left hand crossed the table and caught hold of mine. Then she turned my hand face up and pressed comfort softly into my palm. I looked up and gave her what I hoped was a reassuring smile. She mirrored it almost exactly, then covered her mouth again. I maintain anxiousness about my smiling. You should not. You have the perfect mouth for smiling. Pentha looked up at me again, her eyes meeting mine for a heartbeat before darting away. True? I nodded. In my own language... It's a mouth I would write up. I brought myself up short, sweating a bit when I realized I'd almost said song. Poem? She suggested helpfully. Yes, I said quickly. It's a smile worthy of a poem. Make one then, she said. In my language. No, I said quickly. It would be a bear's poem. Too clumsy for you. This just seemed to spur her on, 
and her eyes grew eager. Do. If it is clumsy, it will make me feel better of my own stumbling. If I do, I threatened, you must too, in my language. I thought this would scare her away, but after only a moment's hesitation, she nodded. I thought of the only Adamic poetry I had heard, a few snippets from the old silk spinner and the piece from the story Cheyenne had told about the archer. It wasn't much to go on. I thought of the words I knew, the sounds of them. I felt the absence of my lute sharply here. This is why we have music, after all. Words cannot always do the work we need them to. Music is there for when words fail us. Finally, I looked around nervously, glad there were only a scattered handful of people left in the dining hall. I leaned toward her and said, Double-weaponed Pentha, no sword in hand. Her flower mouth curves and cuts a heart a dozen steps away. She gave the smile again, and it was just as I said. I felt the sharpness of it in my chest. Valorian had had a beautiful smile, but it was old and knowing. Pentha's smile was bright as a new penny. It was like cool water on my dry, tired heart. The sweet smile of a young woman. There is nothing better in the world. It is worth more than salt. Something in us sickens and dies without it. I am sure of this. Such a simple thing. How strange. How wonderful and strange. Pentha closed her eyes for a moment, her mouth moving silently as she chose the words of her own poem. Then she opened her eyes and spoke in a Turin. Burning as a branch, Quoth speaks. But the mouth that threatens boots reveals a dancing bear. I smiled wide enough to make my face hurt. It is lovely, I said honestly. It is the first poem anyone has ever made for me. After my conversation with Pentha, I felt considerably better. I was uncertain as to whether or not we had been flirting, but that hardly mattered. It was enough for me to know there was at least one person in Hert who didn't want me dead. I walked to Vashat's house as I usually did after meals. Half of me hoped she would greet me, smiling and sarcastic, the morning's unpleasantness put wordlessly behind us. The other half of me feared she would refuse to speak with me at all. As I came over the rise, I saw her sitting on a wooden bench outside her door. She leaned against the rough stone wall of her house, as if she were merely enjoying the afternoon sun. I drew a deep breath and let it out, feeling myself relax. But as I came closer, I saw her face. She was not smiling. Neither did she wear the impassive Adam mask. She watched me approach, her expression hangman grim. I spoke as soon as I came close enough. Vachette, I said earnestly. I'm still sitting. Vachette held up her hand, and I stopped speaking as quickly as if she had struck me across the mouth. Apology now is of little consequence, she said, her voice flat and chill as slate. Anything you say at this point cannot be trusted. You know I am well and truly angry, so you are in the grip of fear. This means I cannot trust any word you say as it comes from fear. You are clever and charming and a liar. I know you can bend the world with your words, so I will not listen. She shifted her position on the bench then continued. Early on, I noticed a gentleness in you. It is a rare thing in one so young, and it was a large piece of what convinced me you were worth teaching. But as the days pass, I glimpse something else, some other face that is far from gentle. I have dismissed these as flickers of false light, thinking them the brags of a young man or the odd jokes of a barbarian. But today, as you spoke... It came to me that the gentleness was the mask, and this other half-seen face, this dark and ruthless thing, that is the true face hiding underneath. Bashat gave me a long look. There is something troubling inside you. Cheyenne has seen it in your conversations. It is not a lack of the Lathani, but this makes my unease more, not less. 
That means there is something in you deeper than the Lathani, something the Lathani cannot mend. She met my eye. If this is the case, then I have been wrong to teach you. If you have been clever enough to show me a false face for so long, then you are a danger to more than just the school. If this is the case, then Karsaret is right, and you should be killed swiftly for the safety of everyone involved. Vachette came to her feet, moving as if she were very tired. This I have thought today, and I will continue to think for long hours tonight. Tomorrow I will have decided. Take this time to order your thoughts and make whatever preparations seem best to you. Then, without meeting my eye, she turned and went into her house, closing the door silently behind her. For a while, I wandered aimlessly. I went to watch the sword tree, hoping I might find Celian there. But she was nowhere to be seen. Watching the tree itself did nothing to soothe me. Not today. So I went to the baths, where I soaked myself joylessly. Afterward, in one of the mirrors scattered through the smaller rooms, I caught the first glimpse of my face since Vachette had struck me. Half my face was red and swollen, with bruises beginning to model blue and yellow around my temple and the line of my jaw. I also had the raw beginnings of a profoundly blackened eye. As I stared at myself in the mirror, I felt a low anger flicker to life deep in my belly. I was, I decided, tired of waiting helplessly while others decided whether I could come or go. I had played their game, learned their language, been unfailingly polite, and in return, I had been treated like a dog. I had been beaten, sneered at, and threatened with death and worse. I was finished with it. So I made my way slowly around Hert. I visited the twin sisters, the talkative smithy, the tailor where I had bought my clothes, I chatted amiably, passing the time, asking questions, and pretending I didn't look as if someone had beaten me unconscious a handful of hours ago. My preparations took a long time. I missed dinner, and the sky was growing dark by the time I came back to the school. I went straight to my room and closed the door behind me. Then I emptied the contents of my pockets onto my bed, some purchased, some stolen. Two fine, soft beeswax candles a long shard of brittle steel from a poorly forged sword, a spool of blood-red thread, a small stoppered bottle of water from the baths. I closed my fist tightly around the last. Most people don't understand how much heat water holds inside it. That's why it takes so long to boil. Despite the fact that the scalding hot pool I had pulled this from was more than half a mile away, what I held in my hand was of better use to a sympathist than a glowing coal. This water had fire in it. I thought of Pentha with a twinge of regret. Then I picked up a candle and began to turn it in my hands, warming it with my skin, softening the wax and beginning to shape a doll of it. I sat in my room thinking dark thoughts as the last of the light faded from the sky. I looked over the tools I had gathered and knew deep in my gut that sometimes a situation grows so tangled that words are useless. What other option did I have now that words had failed me? What do any of us have when words fail us? Chapter 121, When Words Fail It was well into the dark hours of night when I approached Bashat's house, but there was candlelight flickering in her window. I didn't doubt she would have me killed or crippled for the good of all a Demre, but Bashat was nothing if not careful. She would give it a long night's thought beforehand. Empty-handed, I knocked softly on her door. After a moment, she opened it. She still wore her mercenary reds, but she had removed most of the silk ties that held it tight to her body. Her eyes were tired. Her mouth thinned when she saw me standing there, and I knew if I spoke, she would refuse to listen. So I gestured entreaty and stepped backward, out of the candlelight and into the dark. I knew her well enough by this point to be sure of her curiosity. Her eyes narrowed suspiciously as I stepped away, but after a moment's hesitation, she followed me. She did not bring her sword. It was a clear night, and we had a piece of moon to light our way. I led us up into the hills, away from the school, away from the scattered houses and shops of Hert. 
We walked more than a mile before we came to the place I had chosen. A small grove of trees where a tall jumble of stone would keep any noise from carrying back toward the sleeping town. The moonlight slanted in through the trees, revealing dark shapes in a tiny, clear space tucked among the stones. There were two small wooden benches here. I took gentle hold of Vashat's arm and guided her to sit. Moving slowly, I reached into the deep, leeward shadow of a nearby tree and brought out my shade. I draped it carefully over a low-hanging branch so it hung like a dark curtain between us. Then, I sat on the other bench, bent, and worked the clasps on my loot case. As each of them snapped open, the loot within made a familiar harmonic thrum as if eager to be free. I brought it out and gently began to play. I had tucked a piece of cloth inside the bowl of the loot to soften the sound, not wanting it to carry over the rocky hills. And I had woven some of the red thread between the strings, partly to keep them from ringing too brightly, and partly out of a desperate hope that it might bring me luck. I began with In the Village Smithy. I did not sing, worried Vachat would be offended if I went that far. But even without the words, it is a song that sounds like weeping. It is music that speaks of empty rooms and a chill bed and the loss of love. Without pausing, I moved on to Violet Bide, then Home Westward Wind. The last had been a favorite of my mother's, and as I played it, I thought of her and began to cry. Then I played the song that hides in the center of me, that wordless music that moves through the secret places in my heart. I played it carefully, strumming it slow and low into the dark stillness of the night. I would like to say it is a happy song, that it is sweet and bright, but it is not. And eventually, I stopped. The tips of my fingers burned and ached. It had been a month since I had played for any length of time, and they had lost their calluses. Looking up, I saw Vachette had pulled my shade aside and was watching me. The moon hung behind her, and I could not see the expression on her face. This is why I do not have knives instead of hands, Vachette, I said quietly. Damn, nobody's even this yet. is what I am. People like, know something we don't. Chapter 122. Leaving. The next morning, I woke early, ate quickly, and was back in my room before most of the school was stirring in their beds. I shouldered my loot and travel sack. I wrapped my shade around me, checking that everything I needed was properly stowed in my pockets. Red string, wax mommet, brittle iron, vial of water. Then I drew up the hood of my shade and left the school, making my way to Vachette's house. Vachette opened the door between my second and third knock. She was shirtless and stood bare-breasted in the doorway. She eyed me pointedly, taking note of my cloak, my travel sack, my loot. I think we swing out. It is a morning for visitors, she said. Come in. The wind is chill this early. I stepped inside and tripped on the threshold, stumbling so that I had to rest my hand on Vachette's shoulder to steady myself. My hand caught clumsily in her hair as I did so. Vachette shook her head as she closed the door behind me. Unconcerned with her near nakedness, she reached both her hands behind her head and began to plait half of her hanging hair into a short, tight braid. The sun was barely in the sky this morning when Pantha knocked on my door, she said conversationally. She knew I was angry with you, and though she did not know what you had done, she spoke on your behalf. Holding the braid with one hand, Bachette reached for a piece of red string and tied it off. Then, almost before my door had time to close... Carceret paid me a visit. She congratulated me on finally giving you the treatment you deserve. She reached back to braid the other side of her hair, her fingers twisting nimbly. Both of them irritated me. They had no place speaking to me about my student. Bachat tied off the second braid. Then I thought to myself, whose opinion do I respect more? She looked at me, making it a question for me to answer. And then when I'm swinging up on the right, like you like respect your own opinion right more. Side, I, don't know if I said, like you, but you guys should be like, Vachette smiled widely. I hit both of those guys. You are exactly right. 
But Penta is not entirely a fool either. And Carceret can be angry as a man when the mood is on her. She picked up a long piece of dark silk and wound it around her torso, over her shoulders, and across her naked breasts, supporting and holding them close to her chest. Then she tucked the end of the cloth into itself, and it somehow remained tightly secured. I had seen her do this several times before, but how it actually worked was still a mystery to me. And what have you decided? I asked. She shrugged her blood-red shirt over her head. You are still a puzzle, she said. Gentle and troubling, and clever and foolish. Her head emerged from the shirt, and she gave me a serious look. But someone who breaks a puzzle because they cannot solve it has left the Lethani. I am not such a one. I am glad, I said. I would not have enjoyed leaving Hert. Bashat raised an eyebrow at that. I dare say you would not. She gestured at the loot case that hung over my shoulder. Leave that here, or people will talk. Leave your bag, too. You can take them back to your room later. She looked at me speculatively. But bring the cloak. I will show you how to fight while wearing it. Such things can be useful, but only if you can avoid tripping over them. I went back to my training, almost as if nothing had happened. Bashet showed me how to avoid tripping over my own cloak. How it could be used to bind a weapon or disarm the unwary. She commented on it being very fine, strong, and durable, but never seemed to note anything unusual about it. Days passed. I continued to spar with Celian, and eventually learned to protect my precious manhood from all forms of uncouth attack. Slowly... I grew skilled enough that we were nearly even in our bouts, trading victories back and forth. There were even a handful of conversations with Pentha at mealtimes, and I was glad to have one other person willing to occasionally smile in my direction. But I was no longer at my ease in Hert. I had come too close to disaster. Whenever I spoke to Vachette, I thought twice about every word. Some words, I thought about three times. And while Vachette seemed to return to her familiar wry and smiling self, I would catch her watching me from time to time, her face grim, her eyes intent. As the days passed, the tension between us gradually wore away, fading as slowly as the bruises on my face. I like to think eventually it would have disappeared entirely, but we were not given enough time for that. It came like lightning from the clear blue sky. Vachette opened her door to my knock, but instead of coming outside, she stood in the doorway. Tomorrow is your test, she said. For a second, I didn't understand what she was talking about. I had been focusing so intently on my sword practice, my sparring with Celian, the language, the Lethani. I had almost forgotten the purpose of it all. I felt a rush of excitement in my chest, followed by a chill knot in my stomach. Tomorrow? I said stupidly. She nodded, smiling faintly at my expression. Her subdued response did little to set me at my ease. So soon? Cheyenne feels it would be best. If we wait another month, there could be early snow, keeping you from going freely on your way. I hesitated, then said, You aren't telling me the whole truth, Bachette. Another faint smile and a small shrug. You're right in that, though Shane does think waiting is unwise. You are charming in your clumsy barbarian way. The longer you are here, the more folk will come to feel kindly toward you. I felt the chill settle deeper into my gut. And if I'm to be mutilated, it would be better if it were done before more folk realize I'm actually a real person and not some faceless barbarian. I said harshly, though not as harshly as I wanted to. Bachette looked down, then nodded. You would not have heard, but Panther Black and Carceret's eye two days ago in an argument about you. Celian, too, has grown fond of you and talks to the other children. They watch you from the trees while you train. She was still for a moment. And there are others. I knew enough after all this time to read Vachette's small silence for what it really meant. Suddenly, her muted mood, 
her stillness made much better sense. Cheyenne must attend to the best interest of the school, Vashad said. She must decide according to what is right. She cannot allow herself to be swayed by the fact that some few are fond of you. At the same time, if she makes a correct decision and many in the school resent it, that is not good either. Another shrug. So, am I ready? Bashat was quiet for a long time. That's not an easy question. She said, if, like, that was kind of just like a being invited to the school isn't merely a matter of skill, it is a test of fit, of suitability. If one of us fails, we can try again. Tempe took his test four times before he was admitted. For you, there will be only one chance. She looked up at me. And ready or not, it is time. Chapter 123 The Spinning Leaf The next morning, Vachat came to collect me just as I was finishing my breakfast. Come, she said. Carceret has been praying for a storm all night, but it's only gusting. I didn't know what that meant, but I didn't feel like asking either. I returned my wooden plate and turned around to find Pentha standing there, a slight yellowing bruise along her jawline. Penta didn't say anything, merely gripped my arms in an open show of support. Then she hugged me tightly. I was surprised when her head only came up to my chest. I'd forgotten how small she was. The dining room was even more quiet than normal, and while no one was staring, everyone was watching. Vachette walked me to the tiny park where we had first met and began our usual limbering stretch. The routine of it relaxed me lulling my anxiety to a dull rumble. When we were finished, Vashat led me down into the hidden valley of the sword tree. I wasn't surprised. Where else would the test take place? There were a dozen people scattered in the open field around the tree. Most of them were dressed in mercenary reds, but I saw three wearing lighter clothes. I guessed they were important members of the community, or perhaps retired mercenaries still involved with the school. Vachette pointed toward the tree. At first, I thought she was drawing my attention to the motion of it. It was, as she had said, a rather blustery day, and the branches lashed wildly at the empty air. Then I saw a glint of metal against its trunk. Looking more closely, I could see a sword there, tied to the trunk of the tree. I thought of Celian dancing among the sharp leaves to slap the trunk of the tree. Of course... There are several items around the base of the tree, Bashat said. Your test is to go in, choose one, and bring it out again. This is the test? I demanded. It came out a little sharper than I'd planned. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you ask? She countered dryly, then laid her hand gently on my arm. I would have, she said. Eventually. But I knew if I told you too soon, you would try your hand at it and hurt yourself. Well, thank God we saved that for today, I said, then sighed. Resigned apology. What happens if I go in there and get cut to ribbons? Getting cut is usually a given, she said, and pulled aside the neck of her shirt, revealing a pair of familiar pale thin scars on her shoulder. The question is, how much and where? and how you behave. She shrugged her shirt back into place. The leaves will not cut deep, but be careful of your face and neck, the places where vessels and tendons are close to the surface. A cut on your chest or arm can be mended easily, yeah, there is another term less so a severed ear. <clears throat> I watched the tree as it caught a gust of wind, branches flailing madly. What keeps a person from crawling there on hands and know. knees? Pride, she said, her eyes searching my face. Will you be known as the one who crawled during his test? I nodded. This was an issue for me especially. As a barbarian, I had twice as much to prove. I looked at the tree again. It was thirty feet from the edge of the lashing branches to the trunk. I thought back to the scars I'd seen on Tempe's body, on Carceret's face. I dropped like five four Ks. So this is a test of nerve, I said. A test of pride. 
It is a test of many things, Bashat said. Your behavior signifies a great deal. You could throw your arms over your face and rush ahead. The straightest line is quickest after all. But what does that reveal of you? Are you a bull that charges blindly? Are you an animal without subtlety or grace? She shook her head, frowning. I expect better from a student of mine. I squinted my eyes, trying to see what other items were gathered around the tree. I suppose I'm not allowed to ask what the proper choice is. There are many proper choices, and many more improper ones. It is different for everyone. The item you bring back reveals much. What you do with the item afterward reveals much. How you comport yourself reveals much. She shrugged. All these things Shane will consider before deciding if you are to be admitted into the school. If Shane is the one to decide, why are all these others here? Bachette forced a smile, and I saw anxiety lurking deep in her eyes. Shayan does not embody the entire school herself. She gestured to the distant Adem standing around the sword tree. Less does she represent the entirety of the path of the Latanta. I looked around and realized a handful of non-red shirts were not light, but white. These were the heads of other schools. They had traveled here to see the barbarian take his test. Yeah, that guy was literally completely Is this dumb. usual? I asked. Vachette shook her head. I could feign ignorance, but I suspect Carceret spread the word. Can they overrule Shane's decision? I asked. Vachette shook her head. No. It is her school. Her decision. No one would dispute her right to make it. At her side... Her hand flickered, that however. Great, you know. that sounds like a Very well, time. I said. Bachette reached out and gripped my hand in both of hers, oh, squeezed it, then let it fall. I walked to the sword tree. For a moment, the wind eased, and the thick canopy of hanging branches reminded me of the tree where I had met the cafe. It was not a comforting thought. I watched the spinning leaves, trying not to think of how sharp they were how they would slice into the meat of me, how they could glide through the thin skin of my hands and slice through the delicate tendons underneath. From the edge of the canopy to the safety of the trunk couldn't be more than thirty feet. In some ways, not very far at all. I thought of Celian darting wildly through the leaves. I thought of her jumping and swatting branches away. If she could do it, then certainly so could I. But even as I thought it, I knew it simply wasn't true. Celian had played here all her life. She was skinny as a twig, quick as a cricket, and half my size. Compared to her, I was a lumbering bear. I saw a handful of Adam mercenaries on the far side of the tree. Two of the more intimidating white shirts were there as well. I could feel their eyes on me, and in a strange way, I was glad. What's up, Jay? When you're alone, it's easy to be afraid. It's easy to focus on what might be lurking in the dark at the bottom of the cellar steps. It's easy to obsess on unproductive things, like the madness of stepping into a storm of spinning knives. When you're alone, it's easy to sweat, panic, fall apart. But I wasn't alone. And it wasn't just Vachette and Cheyenne watching me. There were a dozen mercenaries and the heads of other schools besides. I had an audience. I was on stage. And there is nowhere in the world I am more comfortable than on a stage. I waited just outside the reach of the longest branches, watching for a break in their motion. I hoped their random spinning would, just for a moment, open into a path I could dart through, striking away any leaves that came too close. I could use fan water to keep them away from my face. I stood at the edge of the canopy and watched, waiting for an opening, trying to anticipate the pattern. The motion of the tree lulled me like it had so many times before. It was beautiful, all circles and arcs. As I watched, gently dazed by the motion of the tree, I felt my mind slip lightly into the clear, empty float of spinning leaf. I realized the motion of the tree wasn't random at all, really. It was actually a pattern made of endless changing patterns. 
And then, my mind open and empty, I saw the wind spread out before me. It was like frost forming on a blank sheet of window glass. One moment, nothing. The next, I could see the name of the wind as clearly as the back of my own hand. I looked around for a moment, marveling in it. I tasted the shape of it on my tongue, and knew if I desired I could stir it to a storm. I could hush it to a whisper, leaving the sword tree hanging empty and still. Apparently, I but that seemed that. wrong. Instead, I simply opened my eyes wide to the wind, watching where it would choose to push the branches, watching where it would flick the leaves. Then, I stepped under the canopy, calmly as you would walk through your own front door. I took two steps, then stopped as a pair of leaves sliced through the air in front of me. I stepped sideways and forward as the wind spun another branch through the space behind me. I moved through the dancing branches of the sword tree, not running, not frantically batting them away with my hands. I stepped carefully, deliberately. It was, I realized, the way Shayan moved when she fought. Not quickly, though sometimes she was quick. Merge. She moved perfectly, always where she needed to be. Almost before I realized it, I was standing on the dark earth that circled the wide trunk of the sword tree. The spinning leaves could not reach here. Safe for the moment, I relaxed and focused on what was waiting there for me. The sword I had seen from the edge of the clearing was bound to the tree with a white silk cord that ran around the trunk. The sword was half drawn from its sheath, and I could see the blade was similar to Vachette's sword. The metal was an odd, burnished gray without mark or blemish. Next to the tree on a small table sat a familiar red shirt folded neatly in half. There was an arrow with stark white fletching and a polished wooden cylinder of the sort that would hold a scroll. A bright glitter caught my eye, and I turned to see a thick gold bar nestled in the dark earth among the roots of the tree. Was it truly gold? I bent and touched it. It was chill under my fingers and was too heavy for my single hand to pry up from the ground. So How much did it weigh? Forty pounds? Fifty? Enough gold for me to stay at the university forever, no matter how viciously they raised my tuition. A murder duck? <laughs> But that'd be copyright, because I can't do Murder Duck, because somebody else already did it. Awesome. Copyright shit. 